It is May 16th, 1991 in St. Paul, Minneapolis. And it happens on this moment to be Woody Herman's birthday and I'm sitting opposite Dave McKenna who I think in 1950 and 51 spent a good deal of time with Woody Herman. It's good to see you again. Thank you. You're good to be here. And I, uh, I didn't know it was Woody's birthday, but <laughs> that'll, that sets me thinking of the old man and, uh, and remembering some nice things. Of course, I irritated him so much on a drunken binge I was on. He didn't speak to me for a few years, but uh, we made it up, and I'm glad we did because he's a wonderful guy. What bands he had, too. <laughs> Well, that uh, herd that you were with uh, was recording, if I remember, for a project called Mars. And uh, was it? I don't. Even, I don't think so. That's not what they called it then. I think we recorded for Capital at first, and, and it, it, they didn't even call it a herd. It was after the second herd, and I think they called it Woody Herman's greatest band ever, which was just a ridiculous hike because it wasn't. But it had some good players on it, though. And then later, when I left, Nat Pierce came on, and they called that the third herd. So I was on. One of the in-between bands. You know. uh, the transition team. Transition, right. <laughs> <laughs> Who were some of those wonderful players on the band with you, that you liked so much? Well, we had uh, in the saxophone section, Al Cohn was still on the band for a while. We had Bob Graff, on ten and then Buddy Wise came on, a wonderful tenor player that had been with Gene Krupa, and Marty Flax played baritone, and Sam Maritz was still on the band at first, but he left. Then different players came through, um, Phil Urso, uh, but the, the trumpet players were unbelievable. We had, at first we had Conti Candoli and Ralph Erickson and, uh, well, um, Bernie Glow, one of the great lead players, was on the band. And Neil Hefty even played on the first couple of gigs. But then we settled in, that was when I had five trumpets. Then it was Conti and Doug Metemi came on the band, and a wonderful player, wonderful player. And, and a, a man named Don, oh boy, he was a Lenny Tristano student. And, uh, Don Farrar, I think his name was. Rolf Erickson, I mentioned this week. Those, Conti, Doug, Rolf, and uh, Don Farrar, they were all great jazz players, but there was hardly any jazz to play in the book. It all went to the saxophone players, so there wasn't much for them to play. Then Conti left, and Nick Travis came on. For, then a guy named Charlie Caudill came on to augment those guys. He was a good jazz player, too. And then Don Fagerquist came on, a wonderful. We had, and Shorty Rogers came on the band for a little while at the, at the Palladium. We had wonderful jazz trumpet players who didn't get much to play. And, we, and the bass player was Red Mitchell at first. And when he left, Red Wooten came on. Sonny Igo was the drummer the whole time I was on there. And uh, the trombones, Bill Harris was still on at first. And Herb Randall and Jerry Dawn, they were section players. And then Vern Friley came around for a while when Bill left, and then Irby Green. And Irby was a jazz and lead player. So that's quite a collection of players. And Out in front was the leader, Woodrow Wilson Herman. And as, uh, as you think about that leader, I know uh, you may have had your bouts with him uh, at one he, point he or another. Great. He was great. I was just a kid in the drunk. And he, he was just... Wonderful to young musicians. I mean, this was, and I became a terrible drunk for a while, and he got a little irritated at me, but uh, he put up with a lot from all of us on the, on the band. And he was a road guy, and I think it's so tragic what happened financially to him at the end, you know, when he struggled to keep his house and all that. It's like IRS fooling with a national institution, you know, like they did with Joe Lewis and forced Joe to have to wrestle in tank towns and attaches pay and all that. That's, that's evil. That's, there should be some law against that, you know? Insulation of some kind. Yeah, I think so. I mean, what, you know, they say Woody was responsible and it was his manager that didn't pay the taxes and got him in trouble and made Woody broke. And anyway, it was a, a great experience to be that young and work with that band because all, all young musicians most of them wanted to work for Woody. Yeah. What do you think you learned uh, from uh, from that experience? Well, it's hard to say, just uh, being on the road, and I guess I absorbed a little. Uh, big band, as it turned out, wasn't my thing, but ending up the opposite, being a solo piano player, but 
for most of, most of the years in between, I played in small groups. So I played with Buddy Moreau's band for a short time, and a, a studio band when I subbed at ABC, that WABC in New York had a, uh, the end of the studio era. Bobby Hackett got me doing subs, and I did it. That Wednesday morning or Tuesday morning band, whatever, that was one of that. Ernie Royal and Sam Marowitz and different, the different drummers were like Maury Feld and Don Lamond and Mel Lewis played a couple of times. And, Peanuts Hucko and Boomy Richmond and Bobby Hackett and, and oh, great players and, and so that was that was only once a week thing and then I play in a big band very rarely when I was with Gene Krupa's small groups for a while on and off, leave come and come back and we did one of those dates where the a reunion type session where Roy Eldridge came back and Anito Day and all that and, and that was fun. So the occasional big band date I do, but uh, mostly it's very small groups, and and most of the time it's playing all by myself. So you can't say that. I mean, the big band experience was nice, but it didn't. Uh, it's not a big part of my life, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Well, Dave, uh, when you think about the big band, I think about your left hand, and you're a solo pilot as it goes. You know, you're out there alone. It seems to me your left hand. Uh, brings in the guitar, the drums, and the bass. Well, not the drums. You can't <laughs> get that, but uh, I hope it, it's, it, you can't make up for the timbre of a bass and guitar. But I'd like to think I get a little of that feeling, you know, and uh, sometimes I don't want to do that. Sometimes I want to play very sparingly and ad lib, and, or even in tempo and play hardly any notes. That's the way I really love to play, kind of quiet mode. And it's a, the funny thing about playing solo piano is sometimes when they're not listening, I can play more things I want to play. You know, make it background music. I'm going to a place, well, I'm going to a very nice place similar to this uh, this weekend. I'm, I'm playing in Schenectady, New York at the Van Dyke Lounge, an old stomping ground, and I play there a lot. And the people love, like music there and they listen. But then two days later, I start two and a half weeks in New York City at this Chinese restaurant. The boss is a nice guy. He probably will never hear this. Al Mass, you're wonderful, Al. <laughs> and the food is good, but it's the loudest place you ever heard in your life. And uh, the place holds conversation noise more than it does the music. And it's just like a madhouse in there. So I just play quietly and watch the clock. And I play a lot of ballads, and I get, get through it that way, you know. Well, your choice of music, uh, that is, your programming, is uh, something that so many musicians could learn. And I think uh, of your indefatigable memory for themes and melodies and how they all come together. Well, it's no big thing. And, and uh, it, it's, it just started as a time killer. And that girl's name medley I played, I didn't even run out. I had more girls' names to play, but I didn't want to go too far over time. I used to kill an hour and ten minutes in some lounges with that, and that's one of the first medleys I put together, real long ones. I do short medleys too, but what they are is time killers. You got to use up some time, people. You got to put in your time on the piano, and if it gives me a little theme to work at, some nights I spend time on one tune more than the others, maybe a couple of them, and, and it may be the night before if I played, I wouldn't play the medley for two nights in a row anyway. But the length of time I give to each tune is varies from night to night. Uh, some night I might play Laura for three choruses, and I only played one chorus tonight, you know, and then play Ida for like six or seven, whatever. And it depends on the mood. And, and so it gives me something, because when I really first started to play, I said, what am I going to play now? Whether they were listening or not, I couldn't. I'd draw up a list of tunes, but I, it wasn't, I didn't feel like playing what I put on the paper, and I'd get I said, geez, I can't think of a single thing I want to play. I just stop and... So with these little medleys, I go from one tune to the other, and at least I fill it up with playing, whether it's any good or not, I don't know. But, you know, I have, a, I have some... It uh, gives me some material. I'm sure you're modest. I, I know that uh, as we sit back in the audience, um, there are flashes of some influences. Going back to your days when you first began to listen to the radio and uh, you know begin to study uh, you, you must have been uh, you know around 10 years old 11 years old 12 years old what were you listening to on the radio well i think that 
I, I liked tunes right away when I was six years old. I used to, there was some jingle my mother told me. I just picked it out at the piano, and I used to pick out tunes. I, I sort of liked cowboy tunes for a little while. Then I heard uh, Harry James or somebody and got onto liking just tunes, songs, any, any kind of song practically. That made, and then I heard Benny Goodman, and I loved him. And I used to listen to horn players. And, and Lester Young with Count Basie, Benny and Artie Shaw, I always loved Artie. I used to listen to clarinet players and trumpet players more than I listened to piano, but Nat Cole influenced me a lot. And he's the first piano player that I really love to listen to. And uh, I, I like I like guys, I didn't even know who they were, and I loved Count Basie's band. I did, uh, whenever I heard it, I, I didn't have a record player, so I used to turn on the radio and try to get to things when Sammy Kay or Guy Lombardo's band had come on, uh, Mickey Mouse, and I'd turn it off and go to another station. And I'd, that's the way. Then I, my mother got me a little record player for Christmas when I was 15 or so on. But I never had much time to build a record collection because only about four years later I was on the road, you know. And I went with Charlie Ventura first. And uh, that was, he broke up that little group and went home and then got a call to try out for Woody's band. And then uh, I never went back with Woody, but. The other people kept repeating. I went back with Charlie when I got out of the Army, drafted from Woody's band in the Korean War and the Army. When I got out, I went back with Charlie. From Charlie, I went to Gene Krupa, back with Charlie. Then with Stan Getz for a little bit, then with Zoot Sims and Al Cohn, a lot. Worked with them. Back to Gene, back to Charlie. And then I was with Bobby Hackett on and off for about, you know, 15, 16 years. And along around there, I started to play more solo. I made my first solo album when I, and when I was about 25 years old. And, uh, but I didn't play many solo gigs then. And, but in the last 20 years, it's been mostly solo jobs for me. I work some of these jazz parties and, and get together with the guys, and it's always nice to play with a band. I don't like the trio format, bass and drums. But I love working with bass and drums and guitar and, and a couple of horns. That's my favorite way to play because I can play more sparingly, you know. But as far as making a living, I, I'm more used to playing solo than anything. Do you find it rewarding in the sense that uh, it's rewarding for you artistically? Well, no, I, I think maybe playing with a little band, like I mentioned, working with bass and drums and guitar, I love guitar. I think, and listen to the guy, I think that's maybe more value artistically but in terms of making a living and being comfortable at what I do, I mean, I, I can't, I'm a sort of a mainstream player. There's all the groups and, for instance, the contemporary groups, I wouldn't be able to play the avant-garde people and all that. There are certain guys that are comfortable to, to work with. But when you're solo, you can't blame anybody. I mean, I, I'm comfortable with it now. And I can change tempos and change tunes and I don't play the same way every night. Where I couldn't do that working with a piano trio with bass and drums, but when I'm working with a band, I'm not the leader, and I just like like to listen to the guy. I, I just made a date, um, recorded with, for Ruby Braff. He was the leader. Ruby and Scott Hamilton and and uh, Howard Alden played guitar. Alan Dawson drums and Frank Tate bass. And that that was two nights of recording last week, I think that was, or two weeks ago. And, and it was Ruby sounded so beautiful, and Scott did too. You know. It was great. I just, you know, that's fun. That's talk about artistic reward. That's was more fun than playing solo. But there are nights when uh, I don't feel like playing. But when I play solo, but the uh, a song that I haven't played for a while. You know, if somebody requests, I say, yeah, you know, you know, you play a song and it gets worked to death, and you lay off it for a year or so, and when you play it again, it sounds fresh. So. There's always some, even if I don't feel like playing, and you force yourself, try to get into a groove here, there's always at some point, and it's not my playing, it's what the tune is, the, uh, the intrinsic value of the song, that it makes me listen to the song a little bit, and we almost wish I could sing. So uh, the tunes are my best friends when it comes to the solo bit and making a living at it, you know. They're, they're like old friends. You know? Those songs, um, do you think of the words, uh, the messages that go along with them? I don't know any words. I, don't, I never sang. Uh, Jimmy Bowman was talking about it. He sings. Huh? Like, and I said, no, I don't know all the words to one song. But I know little bits and pieces of them. And the older I get, 
the more I remember them. And sometimes I'm playing a ballad, and I remember a little bit, and I told him, I think it makes me play better if I remember a little of the words, you know, even though I don't sing. Because uh, I love to, I listen to singers and horn players much more than I listen to piano players. Although, when I do listen to music nowadays, if I don't listen to an old Sinatra or, or a good blues singer like uh, Jimmy Rushing or Joe Turner, or people like Blossom Deary, I mean, I love the singers. And some of the oddballs sing, like Dave Frisberg and Blossom, they're great. Then I listen to Brazilian music. That's my favorite. I don't play it, but they got some beautiful things going on. Really nice. Yeah. So. Dave, just one postscript, if I might. Uh, the, uh, just a historic observation on a couple of personalities that you've worked with, like Charlie Ventura. Oh, I love Charlie. I, I keep hearing that he's in, his, in bad health, and I suspect the worst, but I say, no, Charlie's around, and I think... Uh, if I knew his number, I wanted to call him because uh, I used to. He used to call me once in a while out of the blue at two in the morning, <laughs> and uh, he was the first band leader I ever worked for. And he was played good. Charlie did. He really did. Had some tough luck. Remember, I mean, at his highest day, he was at an RCA Victor recording contract and Bebop for the People. I think it was called Bop for. I was going to ask you about Bob for the people. They're good man. That's it. Uh, I came in on the end of it. Jackie and Roy were the originals, and then they left, and another piano player came on, and I was there for the last few months. And the band had Boots Mazzulli, and he got me on the band. Conti, Pandoli, and Benny Green. Ed Shaughnessy was the drummer, and Red Mitchell was the bass player. It was a good band. And then later on, a little quartet with uh, Sonny Igo and Whitey Mitchell. Red's brother. We came, we played Minneapolis and some Flame or something. I think it was called. And with that first band I mentioned, we played St. Paul for a couple of weeks. I have no idea where that club was. I never saw it again when I came to say. Have no idea where. It seemed to me it was on a little hill, but St. Paul doesn't have that many hills. I don't think. And the, and the hotel we stayed at, I don't remember that either. It's not one of these that I recognize now. I think the place was the flame, and it was across from the Northern States Power Company, a power utility. In St. Paul? Yes. That was the flame, too? What about that place in Minneapolis? What? There was a flame in Minneapolis as well. Wow. Uh, so where would that be in St. Paul like now? Well, it would be the heart of the town. You go downtown. On the, let's see. We're going east, and we would uh, go down along. It would have been uh, 4th Street. The next time I come here, I want to look and see if I can recognize that neighborhood. It, uh, it still exists, as you might remember it, because of this one major building there, yes. But the, the, uh, the club itself, that building is still standing where the club was? No, it is not. It, uh, it's been replaced by a parking ramp and, oh, yeah. and, uh, and a newspaper, uh, the St. Paul Pioneer Press Dispatch. Oh, that's there. <laughs> Were you around here then? I was here, and then I moved to New York uh, and used to broadcast from Harlem, uh, 125th Street and 7th, the Palm Cafe, Boy. 1950 to 56. Must have been fun. It was. It was a privilege. It was a great street academy for an interested broadcaster, especially in the area of jazz. Yeah. One other observation, and I'll, uh, it's been a long night, working with Gene Krupa, yeah, great guy. He it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, he was a nice man, really. Treated me very well. And what a showman he was too. And uh, all the guys I worked for, the, I worked for Buddy Rich for a short time, but not a long time. It was a pleasure to hear his drum solos. You know, nobody else played a drum solo like that. Well, Gene's solos were wonderful too, and and. Uh, and it was Bobby Hackett, my long association with him. He, he was like my uncle, you know. He really was. He was like, we argued a little bit. <laughs> we had a, it was, I really looked up to Bobby. I miss him a lot. I miss all those guys. They're all gone except Charlie, you know. And my contemporaries are Zoot now. And so many guys that I work with. And those guys at Eddie Condon's, you know, I worked at, when uh, Peanuts is still around, of course, and, and Yank Lawson is still around, and, uh, 
Cody Cutshaw and Maury Feld and Cliff Lehman and uh, Lou McGarity, a lot of those, so many, and Eddie himself is gone. So many people have um, left the scene. And, right, you can't stop, uh, dwell on that too much, you know, I don't want to dwell on it. I, I certainly have led you down that path and I didn't mean to, but I want to say it's a privilege to uh, sit in and listen to you again and hear you in performance and to uh, have this uh, uh, brief conversation with you and thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see you again, Dave McKenna. Thank you. It was, it was my pleasure, really. <laughs>